Animal Crossing is a series that's quite literally grown up with me, and one that I've been following since the first US release. We've come a long way from those days, but there's something so interesting and nostalgic about the GameCube version that has kept me playing it more than any of the newer titles. In fact, if it wasn't for the crazy discussions and rumors that lived on the school playground, there's a chance I never would have been introduced to the game at all. Over the years I've poured countless hours into the game, discovering the secrets and rumors that make it so fun and exciting to play. So whether you are a veteran of the franchise or you've never played this version before, I want to rediscover what makes it so special. My introduction to Animal Crossing actually came from elementary school discussions about the game, which spawned many famous rumors. Some of these rumors were funny or quirky, but there were quite a few that were actually pretty scary. One of the most infamous cases of fright-inducing characters was named Brutus. Over the years he's taken many different appearances and names, though is most commonly represented as a purple bulldog. He allegedly wrote letters in binary code, lived in a house full of fish that could freeze the game, and even kidnap your villagers. Brutus's main goal was to cause as much havoc in your town as possible before leaving. These occurrences were so widely discussed back in the day, he's become an urban legend within modern times. No evidence of this character is in the game's files whatsoever, although he was previously thought to exist as a beta character. Despite this, there was an infamous photoshopped image of this character in-game that was used to perpetuate the rumor, although it seems to have been lost to time. In a related case to Brutus, there was a rumor regarding a fish called Deathwing who had red eyes and evil fangs. Assumingly, this fish would spawn randomly, and if you ended up catching it, your entire town would allegedly be reset. Of course, both of these town destruction rumors are totally false, and players were often scared that some random event would cause the deletion of their town. This was a common thought on the minds of players back in the day. Tell me if you've experienced this before. You're walking along minding your own business, and suddenly you spot your favorite villager. When all of a sudden your friend gets really sad, and doesn't want to talk anymore. The resulting emotion that animal villagers have after their conversations end isn't random, but it's actually based on how compatible their personalities are. There are six personality types in the game. Cranky, Jock, Lazy, Snooty, Peppy, and Normal. And each one is more or less compatible with another. What's more interesting is that each gender has gender-specific personality types. The males are Cranky, Jock, and Lazy, while the females are Snooty, Peppy, and Normal. It's also worth pointing out that when any animal shows complete happiness, they tend to speak rare or scarcely used lines of dialogue that you couldn't normally get them to say. However, this is not the only bit of insight they give you. For example, it's pretty well known that hitting animals with the net will cause them to get angry. But did you know pushing them also causes this? Even excessively talking to them will bring out their anger, which can be amusing in certain situations. Animals are even aware when your pockets are full, which prevents you from accepting their work quests. It's so cool to know this information, and it gives so much more depth when it comes to knowing the habits of the animal villagers. But characters were just one piece of the pie. One of the most memorable item experiences players have in Animal Crossing for GameCube were the NES games. These were full, playable NES games that could be obtained in many different ways, whether it be one from the lottery or bought from Crazy Red, or also obtained from Animal Island. While a majority of these are obtainable in-game, there's a few that elude most players. These are known as the Forbidden Four. This term refers to four NES games out of the in-game library that are unobtainable without the aid of outside resources. These include Ice Climber, Mario Bros, Super Mario Bros, and The Legend of Zelda. No universal codes exist for these games, nor can a code be generated. Ice Climber and Mario Bros are obtainable by scanning special e-reader cards that place them in the game. Unfortunately, these cards were rare even back then, and have since become much scarcer in modern times. The remaining two, Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda, are totally inaccessible without using an action replay. Nintendo originally had plans to release these two games through e-reader cards, however, the e-reader was discontinued before the cards could even be released, leaving them in the code, but inaccessible. 
Punch-Out used to be a part of the Forbidden Four list, and together they were formerly known as the Forbidden Five. However, Punch-Out was actually released via a code generator on the official Animal Crossing website. Much of the Animal Crossing NES library was released in this manner. You type in your player name and town name, the website would generate a special code, and you would enter that at Tom Nook's shop. Unfortunately, the Animal Crossing website is no longer available, and the code generators do not work on the Wayback Machine. Have you ever been curious about that blank NES that doesn't have a game to play? Most people probably think it's just a generic looking console used to decorate your room in a more subtle way. However, this item is actually very special, and holds a super secret unused feature. A software security researcher named James Chambers discovered that the NES emulator in Animal Crossing was designed to search the inserted memory card for ROMs. When you interact with the blank NES, a dialog box pops up saying there's no software in it. In this moment, the NES is scanning the memory card for available ROMs. Nintendo never released any add-on NES ROMs for Animal Crossing, so officially this feature goes unused and the NES console will never run anything in normal gameplay. However, James was able to put NES ROMs onto GameCube memory cards in a format Animal Crossing will recognize which is a pretty cool recreation of the potential this feature could have held. There are a handful of strange rumors involving items that got passed around, including a secret gyroid boxing match. It was claimed that when the boxing room theme was complete, two gyroids could be placed inside of the ring, and they'd apparently start a punch-out style boxing match. When tested, it becomes apparent that items cannot be placed inside of the ring at all, so it totally debunks this, but it's so absurd who wouldn't want to believe it. Something pretty cool that actually does work with the boxing set though, is if you ring the judge's bell item while you have the ringside seating wallpaper, the wallpaper will cheer like a crowd. Another item rumor claimed that the Master Sword could be pulled out of its rock as long as the right wallpaper and flooring was used in your room. The rumor never explained which wallpaper and flooring you need, but like all of the common Nintendo items in the game, they do nothing. The Nintendo Power Code set does perform actions when pressed, like the Superstar, which actually makes you flash as if you collected it in a Mario game. It would have been an insanely cool easter egg if you could use the Master Sword as an axe, but unfortunately you cannot. For as much as we've talked about items, we've only scratched the surface with the codes. Animal Crossing uses a password system which allows items to be obtained from entering a case-sensitive code. This is what's known as a universal code, and almost every item in the game has one. This includes items that aren't intended to be used by the player, like the puffy vests and sweatshirts, which are only worn by animals during certain events. There are some robes that go unused too, but you can use a code to get these as well. Additionally, if one decides to go down a list of passwords on a game website, you'd see some pretty interesting ones that spell out words or phrases. Some of the passwords and the items they give you are pretty shocking. A video exists online which showcases some of these in action. Once tested, it does confirm that they work. Some of the coolest codes in the entire game allow the player to obtain villager-only items that are used in work quests, such as the comic book, glasses case, and Pokemon Pikachu. These items aren't attached to villagers, and you can actually place them in your house. Unfortunately, they don't have any visible model since they weren't intended to be used as decorations or seen outside the player's pockets. Back in the day, there was talk that the Pokemon Pikachu actually turned into a real Pikachu who followed you around your house, which would have been a really cool feature, though sadly does not exist. There are also a lot of not-for-sale stationary sets in the catalog, which cannot be acquired anywhere in the game. Universal codes can be used for these too, so you can get that snazzy HRA exclusive paper and write your villagers some letters on it. A very common and old rumor involves catching Tom Nook sleeping in his shop late at night. Of course, the more exciting way that this was described on old forums was claiming you could break into Tom Nook's shop after hours and steal his items. The latter part might be fabrication, but there's actually some truth to this rumor. While there's no way to see Nook sleeping in the US version of Animal Crossing, 
In the Japanese exclusive version, Debutsu no Mori E Plus, you can. Simply tap the back of his shop with your shovel three times, then the lights turn on and the doors unlock. Upon entering, Nook walks around half asleep and you can still even purchase the items. Of course, there's no way to steal his stuff in any version of the game, so that part remains a fake rumor. But if you did, maybe you'd get the same text that generates when you don't show up for work in your uniform! After his outburst is over, Tom Nook surprisingly lets the player wear whatever they want. The next location involves Mr. Rossetti and being able to see his house. There was a rumor that claimed you could find Rossetti's house in the US version of the game. Unfortunately, that's not the case. However, in Debutsu no Mori E+, if you tap a cracked rock with your shovel, you can fall into the reset surveillance center and walk around. Similarly, people discussed an instance where Rossetti could burrow himself into your house from underground, although that's just false. Curiously, while you can't visit the surveillance center in the US version, you can get his theme music to play inside your house. It's actually triggered by a code that replaces all game music with Rossetti's theme. Ironically, resetting the game removes the music. Believe it or not, the post office is one of the best locations in the game to discover secrets, and is probably not somewhere you'd expect to find secrets at all. This time we're going to uncover some rare dialogue that many players have probably never seen. When you go to mail a letter, Pelly helps guide the player through the process, which ultimately leads it to being placed behind the counter for delivery. However, there are certain circumstances that prevent letters from being mailed, and this is where things get interesting. If you try to mail a letter to another player whose mailbox is already full, Pelly rejects it and says the recipient must clear out their mailbox first. That probably doesn't happen too often, but there's an even rarer occurrence we can create. If we know another player has at least one free space in their mailbox, but attempt to mail two letters at the same time, the first one will be accepted, but the second one gets rejected. Her dialogue becomes slightly different compared to the first time, even name dropping Pete. <laughs> That's not all though, as there's a third rare dialogue, but this one you can't create instantly. There was a rumor that got passed around back in the day, which claimed if you wrote a letter to an animal, but never actually mailed it, that would prevent the animal from moving out of town. This would be useful if it actually worked, but it doesn't, so when I tried it I was left with letters to animals who no longer live in my town. These have been sitting in my pockets for years, so what happens when you try to mail them? I'm surprised they went this far with all the different dialogue Pelly has, when they could have easily had a copy-paste rejection message for all the circumstances. I wonder what Pelly would say if you tried to throw out a letter indoors, because don't forget, you can't throw away letters inside. That option only becomes available when you're standing outside. The police station is another interesting location in the game, but not really because of anything inside. Though those posters on the wall are pretty mysterious. And if you click on an item, your character freezes in place when they're supposed to continue their idle animation. But uh, we want to direct our attention outside to Officer Copper. Now, most people probably suspect that Copper is one of the most static NPCs in the game. He always stands there, never moves, never shows emotions. Doesn't really do anything except change his dialogue for whenever there's town goings on. However, that's completely wrong. Copper is just so good at doing his job, you almost never see him do anything else. But if you show up at the right times, he does perform other actions, such as buying turnips from Joan, buying wallpaper from Wendell, and even sleeping. Yeah, Officer Copper has a sleeping animation. 
It's very shocking to discover the secret, which was documented at 2 a.m. Though if you get too close, he will wake up. Sneaking up behind the station should give you the best look. There's one spot in every Animal Crossing town which always made me wonder, the dump. It's a little fenced area of the game where you can drop off your unwanted items for disposal. What's so curious about this place though, is the fact that it exists, yet there are no special events or characters connected to it. There's even a signpost detailing the times when it gets emptied, but no one's ever seen emptying it, and quitting out of the game is the only way for the items to vanish. I recall hearing some rumors back in the day about a gorilla riding around in a garbage truck who collects trash, but that just isn't true. You can grab whatever's been left there for yourself, which is useful for finding an item you've been after, but overall this location seems like a mysteriously abandoned place. There are a lot of glitches in Animal Crossing GCN, but by far one of the coolest glitches found in the game actually sends you to a beta map. This glitch utilizes a wrong warp by entering the post office as the hourly music fades on the same day as the sports fair. After paying off your debt and then leaving, the game attempts to play your debt dance at the same time as the sports fair announcer calls the next event. This overlap in action confuses the game and clips your character through the floor for a second. Afterwards, they respawn in the beta map. There are a few different places to explore in this area. The entire map is very clearly a testing zone for various terrains, structure placements, and villager movements. It's really fun to check out for yourself, though there is no way to get out other than a game reset, so it's advised that you use a throwaway town when attempting this. KK Slider has a big library of songs to obtain in Animal Crossing GCN. 55 air checks that can be played back at the player's house. Three of these songs, KK Song, Two Days Ago, and I Love You, can only be obtained when requested. However, there are an additional three songs that exist if the player enters an invalid song request. These songs are Forest Life, My Place, and To The Edge. Interestingly, these songs technically do not exist in the game, as they cannot be obtained and didn't exist as real songs until Dabutsu no Mori E Plus and onward. Regardless, it's cool how invalid songs eventually became part of KK Slider's library. Did you guys ever expect there to be secrets on the boat ride to the island? Well, there certainly are. One of the most historical rumors in the series belongs to the whale. The whale is an extremely rare event that for a very long time had eluded all visual evidence, so any claims online were regarded as a hoax. The legend of the whale remained that way for many, many years until in 2013, video proof surfaced of the fabled whale encounter. Essentially, the whale is a huge shadow that lingers beneath your boat. It never rises to the surface, and since it's never intended to be seen above the water, it doesn't have an in-game model, so you can't catch it even through hacking. Rumor has it that precise conditions will cause it to bite, but this remains completely unconfirmed. To this day, it's one of the rarest occurrences within Animal Crossing, and very few players have ever experienced it. Similar to the whale, you'll occasionally see Gulliver drifting by in the water, <laughs> although this occurrence is far more common than that of the whale. When someone asks you what your favorite video game is, what do you tell them? Is it a nostalgic title, or a hidden gem you discovered later? For me, this question is answered simply by asking myself, if I could only play one video game for the rest of my life, what would it be? Without a doubt, my answer to that is Animal Crossing on GameCube. From the first time I started my town back in elementary school, to having finally completed the museum only a couple years ago, I love this game and can always find ways to keep busy or discover something new. There is something so magical and pure about this version of the game that I feel will never be created again. And for that reason, I'll never stop playing or discovering the secrets about it. This video couldn't have been produced without some help, so a special thanks to Art School Life for the title card and animations, Brobeck for the capture card, Jack's Cheese for the original music compositions, and Chugga Conroy for the narrations. 
If you enjoyed this video, check out my other Animal Crossing content. Thanks for watching, and until next time, Finn.